Thank you. It's always more fun doing these talks after having done a successful demonstration rather than doing it afterwards. Because with any live technology demonstration, there's always a good chance you stand there and, you know, nothing works. Uh, we haven't fortunately had that happen hardly ever, really. And that was event 88 in 28 countries where we've done this now. So uh, I still assume the worst, though. So I'm glad that worked fine. I hope you didn't get blown too much of the garden debris out there. What I'm going to do with you uh, is share with you the story behind what you've just seen and then also fairly swiftly go on to some of the stuff we've done in the last uh, 12 months that is taking this even further because some of you might have seen maybe the original TED talk we did um, a, a while back. So forgive me for those of you who've seen some of the origins of this. So I was an oil trader in the city of London for about 16 years. I spent some time in the British Royal Marines Reserve I used to run ultramarathons. I, I, I like a crazy challenge. This was clearly in the bucket of crazy challenges. And I had this idea that if, I, if I, I was fairly light and I was reasonably strong from the calisthenics training and the Marines training, I thought I can support my own body weight in a series of kind of gymnastic positions. Surely, logically, mind you, logic doesn't apply to much of this journey. Logically, I can support myself on some form of propulsion some thrust if I could work out a way of putting it in the right places and I could use my brain as the balancing machine and my body as the flight structure. No real practical reason other than I thought it would be a cool challenge. That was it. So alongside my day job, I started playing around with it. Um, part of my inspiration as well is that my late father was um, an aeronautical engineer and I think that, that probably left a big impression on me as a kid, learning to fly model gliders, you know, uh, when, I, when I was about sort of 10 years old. I used to make those things and um, watch them usually crash and probably learned a lot about aeronautical engineering that I didn't realize having done that. However, that's all, that's all great. Um, this is a good little example of how formidable the human frame, the human body and mind can be if you put your mind to something. Look at what the, you know, the mind and body can achieve from a balance and a strength point of view. So, you know, it's a good example of that, but you're missing something, you're missing horsepower. Now, you've had the uh, surprise already revealed out there, but this was the ground zero moment when I started playing with those engines. This was in March 2016. That is one of those little jet engines, and it's putting out about 22 kilos of thrust, and it only weighs about two kilos. So that's an amazing ratio. It does drink a lot of fuel. The fuel is sitting in a container inside that bucket at that stage. It was pretty basic, but that taught me a lot. It's just a push. It wasn't trying to rip my arm off. It wasn't trying to rotate my arm off. It's just like a holding a fire hose of water. So emboldened by that experiment, we went on to try this, which is now, I'm now mobile and I've now got two engines and you can get an idea of the 50 kilos of push when I try and hold them out horizontally. It just shows how strong that was. There's a theme you'll notice in these clips early on. So that's now four of them. And now I'm not coming down quite so quickly. It's still not enough for us to get me off the ground, or me and the equipment particularly, but it was really starting to get there. We tried a, a number of different experiments. This one was uh, an unsuccessful attempt to use a tether. But the problem is with a tether is it's like a fifth force. You've got one, two, three, four and you're trying to sort of balance all of these, and every time you drift from that tether, the tether would pull you back again. So it's now five things to think about. So it didn't really work, so I had to settle for falling over when it didn't work very well. This was an experiment of using six engines. It was just way too much weight and too, frankly, te frankly terrifying. So we settled on this idea of one on each arm, because between one on each arm, it feels like it's going directly up your arm. It just felt quite logical. 
And I thought, well, legs, you know, your legs take your weight really nicely, so why don't you stick an engine on each of them? But as you saw in that clip, I tend to bend my leg just at the last minute, which would tend to rotate me, but we persevered. And then in, in November 2016, so not very many months after starting with one engine, we managed to do this. Still fighting my leg, but it was a, a six second actual coherent little flight. So that was quite a watershed moment. That was the moment when it went from a ridiculous idea to something that actually was demonstrated, you know, demonstrably it actually worked. Uh, there's a nice little showreel now of what we've since gone on to do in the interest of time. This is, this is a, a scattergun of some of the events around the world. You'll notice, just like the suit out there, it doesn't have engines on the legs anymore. They gradually went higher and higher until they were stuck on my posterior, which was better. But then we consolidated them into one larger one, just because it's more reliable um, starting vertically. The other problem with on them on the legs is that they tend to dig a hole in the ground wherever you kind of walk. And finally, the worst problem is you bring your arm past, they sometimes suck in the hot exhaust from your arm engines and then that melts all the blades out, which was a really bad outcome. Um, this is a little summary. Have we got any music on this? Should be some music on this. Anyway, this is a scatter of all over the world. As I say, we, we've had the you know, ridiculous privilege of going to some ludicrous places and not only testing the equipment, but sharing it with you know, great people like you guys. You can see the balance and control is kind of ridiculous. And, and what's really nice is I can now train our pilots to do the same kind of precision. You saw how still I just stood in front of you. It's just effortless. I'm not thinking about anything. I could do a crossword while I'm hovering there. And it's because, and where's, where, I don't know where the neuroscientists, have probably got lots here, but there was a neuroscientist I was talking to earlier. It's because the human brain is such a ridiculous balancing machine. You know, Boston Dynamics have spent millions, probably almost billions to achieve that with a robot. And we do that without thinking. So all I've ended up accidentally doing is tapping into the same skill that we have, but just adjusting it a bit. All I do if I want to go up, I just gradually bring the engines down and I rise up. If I want to stop going up, I flare them out again and come down. If I want to go this way, I just tilt it out a little bit. It's, in, it's entirely intuitive. We've been all over the world. Um, I haven't got time, I don't think, to go through the investment story, but I accidentally raised uh, $650,000 in a car park from Adam and Tim Draper um, just before I did TED, TED 2017. That was fun. That, that's the only VC money we've raised. Uh, all the rest has been self-generated through events and things like that. Um, as an example of a, a more fun event recently, for those of you know who, who know Ken Block is, the uh, quite famous kind of rally stunt driver, um, at Goodwood we decided to ha have a bit of fun this year. It's a nice demonstration, again, of the maneuverability um, and uh, control. Again, you just think where you want to go. There's a sort of aerial donut. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through that one because it goes on for a little while. Although, actually, hang on, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the bit where he ne nearly killed me. I had a great plan with Ken, which was that he was going to drive towards me and drift his car around me because the previous stunt driver had done exactly that. But I thought, actually, I better just jump over him in case he gets it wrong. And he did get it wrong. He would have just swiped me into the crowd. But anyway, that's Ken. Um, now, I'm quite proud that despite this being, you know, something I did for fun, uh, it is actually a commercially successful venture. We did raise that money accidentally in the car park from Tim and Adam, but since then we've generated over $3 million from doing events, from doing TV, from doing promotional things. We've opened baseball stadiums in Japan, we've done car launches in China, um, and we've even sold a couple of suits. Uh, but also, we train people that come along, customers who want to come along and experience this. We actually do a flight training um, kind of offer in, in places like this. So you get tethered so you can't fall over, and you just progressively work through the power levels. And a bit like a child learning to ride a bike, there's a moment where you just get it. I don't think I left the uh, slide in where there's one of my team managed to learn it in four minutes, which I have to say is highly unusual, but he was off the tether and flying around within four minutes of, of training this, or learning this. That's the last suit we sold for about $440,000. We prefer to train people and kind of lease them for use rather than sell them. It'd be a bit like selling a Formula One car. That is a, a 1,050 horsepower suit that will take you over the top of that hotel and go for another couple of miles if you really want to. It's fine if you know what you're doing with it, but if you don't, it's you know, probably going to be our problem. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Um, it's a really 
uh, it's kind of, a, kind of an obvious thing, really, but if you want to get some kids' attention, and I've got an 11-year-old and a 12-year-old, two boys, if you want to get their generation to stop looking at a phone or an iPad, if you go and land a jet suit at their school, that tends to get their attention. So we've done as much as we can fit into the ridiculous diary we have of uh, doing STEM outreach. Um, now, as that says, this is only just the start. We've had this amazing impact all around the world wherever we fly it. I mean, you're best to judge. I mean, I'm, I haven't found many people walk away from that and then find that a bit dull. So we decided that actually due to that demand, we've then, uh, we, we're planning to scale this into a race series. So if this is a little bit of a showreel of some of what we can do, and then there's another clip from a secret bit of filming we did with a Netflix competitor in California that might show this as a, as a series. But the idea will be a whole bunch of pilots, guys and girls from ideally different sporting backgrounds who will get together to race a bit like the Red Bull air race around like inflatable pylons over water. So it's safe if you go in the water. It doesn't do the equipment much good, but it's not that expensive to get it back up. Main thing is it makes it safe and then um, actually run that as a race series all over the world because it turns out most cities have a, a river, a lake or a seafront. And, and what's really nice is it really brings a sort of Marvel superhero thing to life, but you, you've got the human being right at the front and center of it, unlike drone racing where the human's not really out in the front, they're kind of behind the scenes. So that, that's, that's progressing really well. And this little clip, it's shot on an iPhone because I'm not allowed to show the proper footage, but there's four pilots racing and within 30 seconds, two go straight in the water. I, I'm touching on here uh, for this audience some of the technology behind the suit you just saw there. Um, it's all 3D printed now, so all of that, that black and white plastic is all 3D printed and the arm assemblies, um, there's not as much aluminium on them as there used to be because we're actually reducing the cost hugely. Um, they used to be about £40,000 for the pair without the engines and now we've got them down to more like about $15,000 a pair by more smart uh, printing. But we employ additive 3D printing in pretty much everything we do and it's perfect because we barely build a suit that's like the last one. Every single time we fly one, we come up with new ways of improving it. So the, the iterative pace of improvement is pretty rapid. So the ones I was just flying are those ones, for instance. This is all aluminium 3D printing and this is all polymer. And it's great, you can make it yeah, you know, almost any shape you like. <clears throat> now, I've got the privilege next week, actually not next week, this week, Friday, of being in LA, uh, giving the annual talk to the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. Uh, a bunch of astronauts and, and mostly military jet fighter pilots. And this is the subject that they're most interested in. If I'm really honest, this is the subject I find really exciting. So what I did out there was could be described as vectored thrust flying. So I'm flying around blowing air downwards and you know, you can see it's all very accurate and that's great. What happens if you start going faster and faster? Well, you get airflow. So you even feel it hitting your body and your body starts to go flatter and flatter. What if you started to eventually even deploy Marvel style, superhero style, actual wings into the airflow? You'll actually start generating lift in a much more efficient way than just blowing air downwards. So this is the journey we've been on in the last sort of eight, nine months alongside all the events and everything uh, to try and explore that. And it started out in, in pretty much the same way as everything, messing around in that case with model aircraft wings, but um, it, essentially flying around with some experimental wings at a horrendous angle of attack uh, in a really crude way and to try and just start to experiment with what it felt like. Uh, you get the idea. That was one of the first points we started at. Let's have, hopefully have more luck here. Here you go. This is um, the kind of R&D we were doing. Why not just get strap? Actually, that wasn't me. That was one of my colleagues. Strap him to the back of a, our lovely Dodge truck, which goes surprisingly fast backwards, and then drive across an airfield and start to play with different angles of attack and different aerofoils. We even tried... Um, uh, a cut down 50% scale hang glider wing as well. What actually turned out to work better was an experiment inspired by this guy here and his wingsuit. The idea of having particularly a leg wing that would disappear if you did this or actually inflate if you did this because those scoops you can see there would take in the air, that started to look really quite, uh, uh, quite positive. So hopefully if this next clip works, you'll see one of the first tests we did with it. This is one of the first tests we did in earnest with not only the leg wing, but also the upper body wing. So you get the idea. Uh, I started progressing faster and faster. And th this was a, a bit of a live test, really. As it, as it goes on, I get faster and faster and go flatter and flatter. What's really cool is that there's no guidebook on how to do this. The guidebook is being written whilst you're in the air, 
traveling at 100 kilometers an hour, trying to get to the island on the other side, thinking, why don't I try this? And then you feel something horrendous. And you, no, I won't try that again. And, and you're actually live in the moment, feeling the airflow. It's quite a ludicrous experience. This is working great now. I love it. So, uh, yeah, 60 miles an hour. Uh, see, it didn't take me very long to get across to the other side. There you go. There's an FPV shot as well. So the, the leg wing is doing a really good job. I'm not really convinced of the upper body wing there. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't too bad. So if I, I'm going to flick to the next one. Uh, and let's see if that's going to run well. Right, this is a 360 camera shot. So what I've now added is something called strakes, leg strakes. They're little fins like this on my legs. And the way you should think of them is a bit like the feathers on an arrow. When you fire an arrow, an arrow keeps going straight because of the feathers on the back. The effect was remarkable. It meant that I wasn't feeling like I was sliding. I was actually going really, really flat and I could start to sl slide my arm engines more and more behind me to go faster and faster. And you'll see from the speed in a minute down the bottom corner. In a second. I don't know why my foot's flapping. I've got a flappy foot problem because I had that back in the farmyard two years ago. But it seems like it looks like it's going to come off. But anyway, wh whatever it was doing, it worked. If you look at the speed down there, I think we touch 119. Oh no, we do touch 119 kilometers an hour. There we go. That's quite a magic feeling, I have to say. Uh, and then you can see this is then the transition back out of aerodynamic flight, back into p putting the power back up again, and then come back in, brake, 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 stabilize, and then land again. Something the Harrier aircraft and the F-35 aircraft, any pilots, and I've got three of those in my team, uh, used to find a lot harder than I think it is when you're right inside the machine like this. Um, this is only about two weeks ago. These, are, these strake things have now increased massively in size. It's got so good that I can actually aerodynamically bank. I've never experienced that before. That means I can actually, using the airflow, pull round and bank round and feel the g-force as I turn, which is an insane experience. Now, <clears throat> in the interest of time, um, I'm going to probably end it there, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. But there's one more thing I want to share to finish this off. We have a very clear ethos, and it probably came from my oil trading days about taking risk. To do anything in life takes some risk, especially when it's new and especially when it looks as ludicrous as this. Our key rule, though, from an innovation point of view, is take that risk, but analyze what is the worst that can happen. What is the downside of that happening? This is why I wasn't as high, you know, high as the top of the hotel today, for instance. If I can recover financially, reputationally, you know, if I do something really stupid, it's often tempting at an event to go and like surf a bus as it goes past the event or something. Uh, reputationally, financially, but safety-wise, if we can't get back up again from an experiment, we're being stupid because we can't keep that journey of exploring. So everything we do, as far as possible, we cover the downside risk. If it means I've, you know, twisted an arm or something, then, you know, I'll get better. I'm going to show you all the outtakes, all the crashes, all the learning experiences. Well, let's really hope they don't go all juddery and stop. Um, but this is the last two and a half years. No one hurt themselves at any point, believe it or not. There you go. So a lot of these are actually pilot error. That was me falling off. That was me just, I didn't, I forgot I was still w flying at 20 miles an hour and I couldn't run at 20 miles an hour. This guy just worried when he saw the flag and let go of the throttle. <laughs> that was a compressor stall for those technology enthusiasts in the room. That was an engine failure. I knew it was coming, so I was really low. And then my colleague in this next one, he didn't see that one coming. <laughs> that was quite a big one. And all the life jacket goes off automatically, so he's fine. That was contaminated fuel in the Maldives. They put my fuel in a, in a fabric softener bottle. I only found that out after uh, I ended up going for a swim. This guy just turned too sharply. Same with this. As you turn in an aircraft, you need to pull on the power. And they both screwed this up. Gently slides into the water. This is what I was trying to show you earlier. See, there's one crash. Look at that. Whack, straight in the water. Very amusing. And then even more funny, this guy here, look, he goes head first. There, yeah, whoop, straight in the water. Uh, he jumped too early. Nothing wrong with the equipment. You can't superhero launch if you do it too early. And then everybody laughs most at this one. Yeah, thanks very much. That was me because we forgot uh, to keep taking the air out the top of the fuel bladders at an event. It wasn't very high. It looks worse than it was. But... Um, Anyway, those are all examples of learning from uh, mostly safe failure. Um, there is loads on Instagram, particularly at the Take On Gravity page there, 
Um, this journey is only at the beginning. It's going to scale into a race series. It's going to scale into flight experiences. Hopefully, even I was having a conversation with somebody about setting up a flight experience venue here. Um, this is only just the beginning. And uh, watch this space. Thank you very much. <laughs>